The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, humans discover the ecosystem is sentient. When aliens invade and Gaia holds us like a weapon. Loving robots and roving mindless zombies. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have an interview with Martin L. Shoemaker this time. Martin discusses his great new debut science fiction novel, Today I Am Carrie. Today I Am Carrie is based on Martin's Nebula finalist story, Today I Am Paul. Martin talks about how it became a novel, and we talk characters, plot, and theme about this really timely novel about a robot caretaker who looks after an Alzheimer's patient and grows to a kind of sentience as it becomes part of a family. The book has already garnered great reviews, and I think this is an amazing first novel you'll want to check out. And we continue with complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. Have we got some March greatness for you. The Bay and March original hardcovers and trade paperbacks are now at booksellers. First up is Voices of the Fall, edited by John Ringo and Gary Poole. These are original stories set in the best-selling Black Tide Rising series. Civilization has fallen. Everyone who survived the plague lived through the fall that terrible autumn when life as they know it ended in blood and chaos. Nuclear attack submarines facing sudden and unimaginable crises. Paid hunters on a remote island suddenly cut off from any hope of support. Elite assassins never made it retirees. Bong-toting former soldiers. There were seven and a half billion stories of pain and suffering. Courage, hope, and struggle crying out from history. Remember them. These are their stories. These are the voices of the fall. Also out in March is Moon Tracks by Travis S. Taylor and Jody Lynn Nye. Race Around the Moon. Barbara Winton and the rest of the Bright Sparks, Dr. Keegan Bright's team of youthful scientists, are competing in the first ever race to completely circle the moon. The Sparks must count on each other as they face thousands of kilometers of unknown dangers where a simple accident can have fatal consequences. While the Sparks compete in the race, Dr. Bright himself is part of a groundbreaking project to seek out rare minerals underneath a crater. Then, on the far side of the moon, in the airless frozen depths beneath the lunar surface, disaster strikes, and only the Bright Sparks are close enough to help him. Finally out in March is this great debut science fiction novel, Today I Am Carrie, by Martin L. Shoemaker. Machine. Human. Carrie. Mildred has Alzheimer's. As memories fade, she acquires the aid of a full-time android to assist in everyday life, Carrie. Carrie takes care of Mildred, but its true mission is to fill in the gaps in Mildred's past. After Mildred passes on, Carrie must find a new purpose. For a time, that purpose is Mildred's family, to keep them safe from harm, to be of service. Carrie struggles. Carrie seeks to understand life's challenges. Carrie makes its own path. Carrie must learn to live, to grow, to care, to survive, to be. Today I am Carrie by Martin L. Shoemaker. Moon Tracks by Travis S. Taylor and Jody Lynn Nye. And Voices of the Fall, edited by John Ringo and Gary Poole, are now available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Martin L. Shoemaker to the podcast. Back to the podcast. Hey, Martin. Hey, Tony. Good to talk to you again. Martin L. Shoemaker is a programmer who says that he writes on the side, or maybe it's the other way around. His uh, second place story in the Jim Bain Memorial Writing Contest earned him, earned him lunch with Buzz Aldrin. I was at that lunch, too. Um, and programming never did that, he claims. His Clark's World story today, I Am Paul, received the Washington Science Fiction Society's Small Press Award and was nominated for a Nebula Award. 
and it's been reprinted in multiple years best anthologies and translated into eight languages and Martin has uh, written, a, he's, he's an award-winning short story writer in many, many other uh, aspects. So you're a Writers of the Future guy too, right? Yep. Yep, volume 31. And your stories have appeared all over the place and to, to critical acclaim. Um, what is the, you have a series you call the Blue Collar Science Fiction Series or something like that? That's Yeah, that's kind of the future history that I write a lot of my stories in. Um, just because once you've created a, a world, it's really a lot easier to keep using that world for future stuff. Well, out now is at booksellers everywhere is Martin L. Shoemaker's debut novel, Today I Am Carrie. Martin, this sounds like, and I know it is, based on uh, that sort of takes off from that story of yours, Today I Am Paul. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the very early origins, the conception of this? Yeah, the um, the short story itself was one of one of my morning experiments. Once in a while, I will just in the morning in the shower, I'll have a start of a story idea, and I will dictate it on my drive into work. And this was one where I was just thinking about the android and the Alzheimer's patient. And I was hit with what I thought would be my opening line. It ended up being, I think, about the third line. Today I am Paul. And just the whole premise fell out from there. And I just dictated. Uh, on a really good day, I can dictate 100 words a minute. And this was one of those days I have about a 50-minute commute to work. And I dictated 4,995 words on that commute. Just, just, just all came out. Wow, wow. So, um, well, let's talk about, since you've brought it up, let's talk about the write, your writing process, um, especially on this book, um, a bit. Because, like you say, were you, do you dictate into a recorder and transcribe it, or what, what do you do? Yep. Yeah, on, well, on this book, I did different than I do now. This was the book that kind of changed my process. Um, I basically... Now I'm using the Dragon Naturally Speaking software because prior to this I was using a transcription service, and this was the book that convinced me that that's just not cost-effective for novels. I'm happy with the results, but it was um, the the transcription rate for the service I was using, a wonderful service. They do a great job, but it's a penny and a, a quarter per word. You take 90,000 words, and that adds up. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that that was when I decided that that getting a, a expensive microphone and the Dragon software and transcribing manually or transcribing with the program was more cost effective. But my basic yeah. process hasn't changed. It's only what I do once the dictation is done. I um I start out in the morning. If I have an idea from like in the case with this book where I'm working on the continuing project. I start out reviewing the last five minutes of, of what I did the day before. And when that's all set in my head, so I know kind of where I'm at and where I'm going, I start the Jeep up and get on the road and drive to work for 50 minutes to an hour and transcribe the whole way. And then when I get out of work, I listen to the fi last five minutes from the morning and then start up the engine and head off down the road and transcribe again or, or dictate again. Um, and in this case, I had kind of a pretty strong vision where I was going. So I dictated the entire first draft that way in not quite six weeks, back and forth to work every day, and sometimes yeah. weekend dictation as well. Now, today I'm Carrie is is a first person, uh, I think it's first person. Uh, let me just make sure. Yes, it is. I should know. I edited the dang thing, but it, some, sometimes these things slip out of your head. Um, and it is divided into into chapters that are basically um, episodes in Carrie's life. Um, were you dictating a chapter at a time, or was it you you got through something you might start up another one? It varied. Um, generally speaking, it would be. I would start out the day with an incident that I wanted to get covered. And if I could do that incident all inside of one day, 
which is on a, on a slow day, I do 3,000 words a day. And on a fast day, I can do ten to or five to ten thousand words a day. Um, and the chapters, generally speaking, were in the range where I couldn't do them all on a slow day. So sometimes I would be coming back and finishing something up the next day. Um, but but sometimes I would be because some of those were pretty short chapters. Some of them would be multiple ones in a day where I'm just trying to get across a quick incident, a quick incident, a quick incident. Well, let's talk about the story. Um, can you, I, I suppose, just uh, just set it up? Um, we have Carrie. He is the main character. Yep. Carrie is an android. He, he, he's not Carrie at first. Right. It, it's Legally, it's got some long string of random um, serial numbers that I made up and can never remember and always have to search out and copy and paste whenever I want to put it into the text. Um but this this android is a medical care device with advanced artificial intelligence to basically let it do two things very well understand or empathize with people and emulate people and the power of this is that it can try to understand who the alzheimer's patient needs it to be because she's having delusions so it's trying to be who she expects to see around her. Um, this actually came very much from my mother-in-law's last year of life. I, I'm such a subconscious writer. I think the story was already out and published before I recognized how much of my mother-in-law's illness was actually in the story. That that she would have delusions where there, there were kittens running around loose in her room. There were absolutely kittens running around loose. And the doctors basically said, you can argue with her about her delusions and you'll make her upset. Or you can just go along with it and you'll make her comfortable. Nobody can do anything to cure her at this point, so why don't you go along with it? And so we had some sometimes amusing days of chasing down runaway cats and relatives who were visiting who were long, long dead, but she saw them as visiting. Um, it was it was part of just the comfort that there was not much else anyone could do for her other than go along with how she saw her world in her last year. And I hadn't realized that was what I was recreating, but I was. Carrie uh, is at first, he's an it, he's not a he, I should say that. I keep calling him he because Millie uh, initially calls him Mr. Robot. So I sort of got it in my mind, but, but throughout the book, we don't, you don't use the, um, uh, that pronoun, you use it, right? Right. There, there are in fact some deleted scenes where, where this comes up that Carrie is adamant about it being the proper pronoun because that's its part of its true identity. Carrie spends a lot of time emulating the identities of others and emulating them with great fidelity. So when he's Paul, he's he. When she's Susan, she's she. But when it's itself, it's it. That is that is a cool part of it, of, of the narrative. So tell us about Carrie's coming to sentience or at least what, Carrie's initially not so sure that it is sentient, and it has to sort of be argued into it by its creator in a way, right? Yeah, and and I think that's sort of the the concept that I I mentioned in there about sort of an emotional Turing test. That the classic Turing test is a machine is intelligent if you can't tell that it's not, and similarly, Carrie's behavior is perceived by others around it as being caring and and alive and real. And so it's treated as being a person. And it has to learn to accept this of, well, maybe that's the only definition that counts. And Carrie is, throughout the course of the book, we find that he may be unique. Yes. And that was part of the the complicated part because thematically for the story, I felt like Carrie needed to be unique. That that 
that the uniqueness and the exploration of that was was part of Carrie's journey. At the same time, as a programmer myself, I had a hard time saying that, gee, here's something that can occur in an electronic system. Why can't it occur again? And so I spun a lot of techno babble on that, but it was really more a matter of the theme I was trying to trying to hit was this character's recognition of its place in the world so i wanted that place to be unique yeah well you make your um you make your uh, pseudo scientific bull um be part of the story when them attempting to make some changes or, or trying to uh, emulate carrie by directly copying um it starts to mess with him and they stop doing it right or or they don't want to do it. Actually. Yeah. And I think if they had pursued that line of research farther, they might have succeeded, but it would have been at a risk to carry itself as a conscious being. And by that point, the people around it cared too much to risk it. There is a lot of caring in this, in this book. There's a lot of uh, deep feeling. Um, it, it reminds me that thematically it reminded me so much of of um on a on a sappier side say robin williams uh say bicentennial man or some other just several of his movies um it also reminded me in a way of uh that great movie being there in the great book that it was based on the one with peter sellers in it um are any of these influences on you or are they definitely an influence i expect to hear that one brought up um won't surprise me if some people will accuse me of just copying it and I I I can't say that it wasn't an influence. I think I've told a very different story, but the tropes are similar. I think Bicentennial Man was more about the character's pursuit of recognition and rights, whereas Carrie is more about really about the feeling and the emotion and the the learning to be a person. But I think, I think more than the Williams movie, the original Asimov story it was based on was just absolutely a classic. Um frankly, to to be to be brought up in the same same sentence or same breath with that to me is a high compliment. Yeah, yeah. Well, like you say, there's the, this this feeling of empathy, and the book is about empathy and the and the role it might play in in self awareness. Um, so let's start out with what the story is here. Um, we start with Carrie caring for um, uh, Mildred, who is an old lady in the final or in later stages of Alzheimer's. And Carrie's basic capabilities are just to be able to do basic medical diagnostics and and therapies and treatments and so on just your your basic patient care in a home environment but they've added on these experimental modules for empathy and for emulation so that their hope is that it can try to understand her needs better and to therefore provide her more more caring care that it's not just mechanical that it's something that understands what her needs are and responds to them not just going through the motions and it also is physically able to make itself resemble the person enough so that it they can fool mildred right yes and 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 it's clear at various points in the text that that there's probably an uncanny valley effect there that if anybody looks at all closely they'll realize it's an emulation not an actual person but but it's enough to evoke the proper emotional recognition i don't think do you ever i thought there was one moment where susan meets carrie when he's emul when it is emulating her that that is definitely weird for Susan. It it is an uncomfortable thing for people to see themselves as others see them. 
and it, especially because Carrie's ability with empathy is such that it really is portraying the real person, which might not necessarily be the person that you, you hope you're portraying. That it's portraying all of her, her fears and her concerns at the same point that she's trying to put on a brave front so that nobody knows she's afraid. Yeah. And we should, uh, so Susan is uh, Mildred's uh, daughter-in-law. Mildred's son is Paul. Um, their child is Millie. And it's not, uh, not a big spoiler because the, the novel is not ultimately about Carrie and Mildred because Mildred passes away in, in the course of the, the very start of the book. Um, after some really cool stuff happens, uh, and Carrie does some interesting stuff that we won't uh, divulge. But um, then, Car then what happens after that? Um, Carrie is w goes back to the company expecting to be wiped and reassigned, right? Yeah. And and the the um, Carrie's creator, Doctor uh, Doctor Zinta has already recognized that Carrie is different. And she is of the opinion that the difference is because of the environment it's been operating in, this family that has accepted it as part of their extended family. And so she wants to, wants to find out more about this phenomenon by leaving it in that environment. And so she pulls a few strings and and finagles the legal department such that Carrie becomes their property after Mildred is gone, so that Carrie is now able to stick around. Carrie is going to grow old with this family, if, unless he gets dismantled in Belize. <laughs> um, the first thing he's doing is taking care of the little girl, right? Right. And in a lot of ways, they are they are siblings, when you think about it. That in terms of emotional development, Carrie is a child. Carrie's a very smart child that knows a lot about medicine, but in terms of understanding what it is to be a human, Carrie is growing up right alongside Millie. And Millie, uh, one of my favorite moments in the book, and is is as Carrie begins to understand what Millie's conception of Santa Claus is and talks to Paul about it and and the whole sock monkey incident and frog monkeys. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, because it's it's that is the way that Carrie sort of creates itself. Yep. Yep. Millie Millie's sister Anna has gotten married, moved to England and it's the first Christmas without Anna, and Millie is kind of desperately trying to cling to to Christmas traditions as she's grown up with them. And she's not that old, so it's not like you can have a lot of traditions, but for kids that age, if we did it last year and we did it the year before, we've got to do it this year. And Anna always made sock monkeys for Christmas decorations. Um, there, there's an amazing amount of this story I mean, they always tell you, write what you know. There's an amazing amount of this story that comes straight from my own life. Not that I ever made sock monkeys, uh, but my friend and fellow writer, uh, Melanie Metters, for a while was making sock monkeys on um, putting up, up on uh, Etsy. And I don't know why. It's nothing I can explain. Sock monkeys make me smile. I just get an, an absolute grin out of sock monkeys. So I bought some of her sock monkeys, and my mom decided that if we were going to have all these sock monkeys around the house, we really should have them around the Christmas tree. And so when I started telling a Christmas story, I had to throw sock monkeys into my Christmas story. And how was I going to justify that? Well, it was because Millie wanted the sock monkeys, and, and you were always supposed to make new sock monkeys. It was part of your Christmas tradition. <coughs> Excuse me. And so she wanted to make sock monkeys, but Anna wasn't there to do it. So she turns to the next best thing, which is her friend, the robot, 
who she says, we've got to make some sock monkeys. And she has to explain what a sock monkey is and why it doesn't look like a monkey, but it does look like something other than a sock. And try to get it to understand the whole purpose of this. And in the process, it starts seeing her worldview of why this is important, why it matters to her that we have these traditions that we're carrying forward. And then from there, it starts recognizing that there are all of these family traditions related to the holidays and the family togetherness and everything that weren't part of its medical training. And if it's really going to try to understand what being a person is, it needs to broaden its horizons and start looking at these parts of life as well. And after a discussion with Paul, her father, it decides it needs to get her a gift and decides to make a sock frog. Um, the frogs, there, there's actually somewhere out in the world, i.e. on my hard drive on my computer someplace, there's actually a movie script for Today I Am Paul because a friend challenged me to write one to say, hey, you ought to learn how to write scripts. And the frog, Millie's fascination with frogs came out in that script. And the script has never seen the light of day for anybody else since then. But that's where I picked up this idea that, that Millie's really kind of geeked about frogs. And I've known kids who at a very young age get fascination with some sort of animal. With Millie, it's frogs. And so Carrie's deciding it's going to make a sock frog. And that's part of how it's integrating itself into the family traditions, is making Millie her sock frog. Well, let's talk about some of the other. And, and Millie will grow up during the course of the book, or she'll get older um, and become a young woman. Um, and some of the other characters, Paul, her father, um, and Susan especially, um, she is not particularly a fan of Carrie at the beginning of the, the story, right? It's, again, I'm a subconscious writer. Um, the I am absolutely thousand percent grateful for all the fans of this story and at the same time for a long time I was really confused about it what of all the things I've written why was this the one that was taking off so well with people um, and and writing is different from analysis eventually I sat down and tried to understand my own story from a reader's point of view and I realized that Carrie is in some ways the perfect neutral, non-judgmental, outside observer of every person in the story. <clears throat> of, of, and of the, in, in the original story, of the impact this disease is having on them. That the patient is not the only one living with this disease, that everyone is. And, and I'll be honest, when I wrote the story, I thought Susan came across as a really troublesome character. I really thought that I had given Susan just if not the villain role because it's there's no villains in it, but Susan was the character who came off badly. So imagine my surprise when readers were coming back to me and telling me how I really understood them and they knew that when they read Susan's character, that I had understood how they were affected by this disease. And so I had to go back and reread Susan's parts and realize that that by trying to represent Carrie's understanding of her, I had captured all of her fears that she never dared voice. That that this, whereas for Paul, it's he's losing his mother. For Susan, it's what if this were me? I can't take what's happening to her. What if it was me? Susan, in fact, is, although she isn't showing it necessarily, Susan is, as empathetic as Carrie, because she can so easily see herself in this same position, and it makes her afraid and makes her distant. And besides which, it's her mother-in-law. They've never honestly been that close. You get distance in families like that. But for Susan, it was, here's this person, and she's important in the family. We've never been 100% aligned. But in the meantime, there's this whole other side of, I'm afraid this could be me. <clears throat> and so Carrie was in some ways a problem for Susan because 
it was representative of the disease and also at the t same time representative of the guilt in some sense. It was a very delicate balance here, this whole concept of the androids taking care of your mother-in-law so you don't have to. That's kind of a hard feeling for people in this sort of situation where it's like you get guilt for having your family member go into an assisted living home or into a nursing home. You feel awful guilt because you've hit limits. And you knew, if anybody had asked you five years earlier, you knew you would do whatever it took to take care of them. You'd do whatever, you'd drop anything. And then when the time really comes, you start hitting limits and you start realizing that one person can't do everything. You do need the help, but it still causes some guilt. Yeah, and this is, it's not just that, um, you know, the story does touch um, a lot of people's experience. It's also that this is a societal issue that's coming up right now because there's a lot of, there's a big cohort of boomers who are, who are um, hitting this moment um, where, you know, a sizable percentage of them are getting Alzheimer's or um, dementia of some sort, and they're, their children are having, or their their loved ones are having to uh, come to terms with it. Yeah, in my mother-in-law's case, it was actually Parkinson's, not Alzheimer's, um, which was a surprise to me that Parkinson's has a dementia component to it. Um, when it came time to write the story, I went with Alzheimer's just because that was the more common place <clears throat> where delusions happens. But it turns out that there's lots of different conditions that all affect the brain in in this area well let's talk a little bit about the uh the cute aspect <laughs> at least i found it so of carrie as matchmaker um his uh after dr zenta gets older um the scientist named wayne uh begins to uh, get in the picture and he has got a little thing for millie right but he has issues with telling her about it yeah, I mean, he, he's he's a programmer, engineer, geek. I know the type all too well. Now this is this is after Millie grows up. She's not a kid anymore at this point. So, yeah, yeah, she she's in college at this point. <clears throat> so, but be, because of its empathy abilities, Carrie can see these struggles, and at the same time, because of its medical programming, which basically is like, I, I don't remember if the word HIPAA ever shows up in the manuscript, but it's basically HIPAA constraints that you can't reveal patient information without release. So Carrie is often aware of issues that the person might not be aware of, and even if the person is aware of, might not want anybody else being aware of. So Carrie is very aware of the fact that Wayne is starting to develop feelings for Millie and that Millie is trying to starting to develop for feelings for Wayne, Carrie's sitting there as that perfect neutral observer who has to keep its mouth shut and trying to figure out ways around the rules while keeping its mouth shut. And that's a, that's another aspect of sentience is the this ability to to figure out how to how to fudge the the fuzzy logic of relationships so that you're not betraying and yet you're in and you are facilitating but you're not doing something wrong right that's pretty sophisticated for Carrie to to be able to do and it's a sign of of the maturation that it has over time found these loopholes it, it's never comfortable with the loopholes but it has found the loopholes that that it can say things like I can't tell you that and that tells you that there's something it can't tell you. And if you're thinking, you can figure out what it is it can't tell you. So it, it can it can dance around a topic without ever actually saying outright what the topic is. Let's talk a little bit about, well, let's do talk about the legal issues, in it, or at least um, you have a trial in the book. Um, Carrie is on trial. Uh, when the family travels to Belize, um, they meet up with this this guy named Colonel Rejon. Um, what is his problem, and what happens there? Uh, I mean, we don't want to get the whole thing away, but let's get a setup at least. 
Well, in this future history, uh, Belize has had problems with their neighbors, and it's I, I'm in the middle of a head cold, so I've lost the name of the country. But basically, it's a country ne right next door that they've had problems historically for centuries. And seldom is it turned into active warfare, but it's happened over the centuries. And in some future date, it's turned into active warfare with automated soldiers. And the automated soldiers almost crushed the Belize Defense Forces. And so the colonel especially, but Belize culture in general is a little bit paranoid about automated creatures in their in their country at this point. That there's a history there. Automated creatures are not a good thing. And the colonel is Honestly, he's a patriot worried about his country, worried about what could go wrong, and it's sort of the classic always fighting the last battle. That the last time he had to deal with automata, it almost killed him and almost killed his country. He's going to take this very seriously. And when he's assured that, no, no, this one is safe, this one is safe, it's not a problem, of course, you shouldn't be surprised then that the next thing that's going to happen is that there will be a problem, not of Carrie's making, but a chance to prove the colonel right. And so now Carrie's got, got its life on the line for, you know, we didn't want you here, and now you've done this thing. Maybe we should just have you destroyed. Yeah, and the argument that... Kerry makes is not that he it, it's a human argument it's, it's not that he couldn't now do these things uh, do bad things but that, that he wouldn't um, he has to convince the judge that he's more than one of these battle automatons right it's aware of the the complicated moral issues and that it is making choices to be not a monster but to be instead just someone who cares for its family that is a that's a cool interlude um and another uh, side story in the in the book that um, that you obviously care a lot about because you wrote a short story um, that sort of related to it. <laughs> the book is um, Carrie. After a while, gets a job. And what is that job? Who does he meet there? Well, Carrie is at some point declared obsolete. I mean, let, let's face it: computer technology. If a phone is two years old, it's ancient. Well, here's a robot that was taking care of Millie's grandmother practically from when Millie was born. By the time Millie's in her 20s and and later, this is ancient technology. And as if you work in the field, you'll eventually find that you will find points where technology gets decertified. The manufacturer basically says, no, we're not supporting that for that anymore. It's too ancient. It's too difficult. Carrie gets decertified. It can't get new upgrades, but it still knows the basics of patient care, and particularly for patient care involving mental issues, mental difficulties. And so Carrie finds itself volunteering at first, eventually on staff at a nursing home specializing in <coughs> specializing in. Uh, memory issues and related cognitive issues, um, which is, in my mind, it is exactly the nursing home that my mother-in-law was in, although hers was more a general purpose nursing home. They definitely had plenty of people with cognitive issues. Um, a year or so later, it was also the nursing home my mother was in when she broke her hip. So it's definitely, they're not only cognitive, but this is the people I had in mind and the care they're providing was what I wanted to convey in here. <clears throat> and while there, he meets a, a circus acrobat slash juggler named Luke, and 
Luke insists on calling him Bo, which is a joke that I'm not sure anyone of any generation younger than ours is even going to get the joke there. Um, but insists on calling him Bo, and later on I had to say, why is this? It's like, well, this is a facility for people who've got mental impairments. Luke isn't good at remembering names. And and I start remembering people I've known where where they'll tag any name on you because that's the one they can remember. And so that sort of became Luke's Luke's um, running joke is not necessarily remembering people, so he'll tag you with a joke name instead. And Luke becomes, and uh, again, subconscious writing. I hadn't known this at the time. Luke eventually becomes Carrie's best friend outside of the family. And that gave Carrie a new dimension that Carrie could have this relationship that wasn't the people it was supposed to be around with, the people that were part of its legal family and the people it had grown up caring with for and everything. This was somebody who was outside that Carrie could just relate to as another person. And then the circus element started coming in and Again, subconscious, I don't remember why Luke was an acrobat and a juggler, but that started drawing in circus elements from there. The subconscious side of this is my dad always loved the circus when I was a kid. And I got the love for circus from him and also from uh, Barry Longyear's Circus World stories in Asimov's way back in the day. So I wouldn't say I'm a circus scholar, but I'm a circus aficionado. I, I love the circus culture, and I started looking for bits of that to draw in to, to round out Luke's character. Yeah, it's a wonderful uh, sort of buddy relationship, and they they um, they learn how to work with each other in in a way. It um, and it certainly helps Luke in profound ways. Yeah, and it it gives Carrie this outside view that it didn't have from just in the family. Mm -hmm. So part of the book, um, the latter part is, is uh, sort of about how a sentient piece of technology, a sentient robot Android uh, would age um, and what that might mean. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And, and again, we're 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 back to this issue of how fast technology evolves versus people. That if we're getting up into the 60s and 70s and 80s, for a person, you're 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 wearing out. Um, yeah, we hope medical science advances so that that's that's healthier than anybody's ever been at that age before. But you're wearing out. But when you look at at technology, I mean, 70 years back, we hadn't been to the moon yet. 70 years back, the total computing power of the world was probably less than we're using in this phone call. So at that stage, Carrie is mechanically, electronically, is so completely out of date that if it were not seen as a person, you'd have long since thrown it away or maybe th thrown it into a museum. Carrie is outliving its its useful lifespan specifically because it's a person. You don't throw people away. It's part of our family. You don't throw family away. But it definitely starts to be a difference that Carrie can no longer get the maintenance that would have once been possible because literally the the techniques aren't known anymore. That that the the technicians don't learn those te techniques anymore because they're not relative or not relevant. Um, I like to say that skills have got a distribution curve of relevance, and at one point they're critical. Past a certain point, they're interesting hobbies. Um, yes, there are people today who can make their own bows and arrows, and I applaud them for it. There are many more people who can shoot a bow and arrow, and I applaud them for it. But in terms of how often they use those on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe if they go out and hunt for their own food, but the, the, there was a point where these were vital life skills everybody had to know. Today, there's a few people who know them because they're fascinated by those topics. 
Terry's at that stage later on where people don't know how this old technology even worked. You look at how um, telephone switches from the 1960s work. I doubt that your typical telephone technician today knows nor cares how those switches worked because that's nothing they're ever going to have to work on. What they care about is the latest, coolest thing in technology today, and they've got to be up on that because that's what they're going to be installing next month. Carrie's past that. Carrie's at a point where no one quite understands even how it works anymore. And the, the way that you describe the inner world of Carrie is this this really cool blend of um did your work as programmer sort of inform this i'm sure it did of course um the the way that the the emulation mass sort of interacting and create something greater than uh either either emulated personality that he's assumed well i i have to be honest up front I don't actually work in artificial intelligence. I work in desktop software. So my knowledge of the area is is very much just reading and research, not um, not actual hard, hands-on hard application. In fact, although the, the original short story has got rave reviews all over the place, I can point you to one review where he utterly, utterly, utterly trashed the story because I know nothing about artificial intelligence. And it's like, hey, that reader's perspective is as valid as any others, but everybody else likes it. So if I if this guy didn't like it, he's entitled to his opinion. Yeah, sure. Well, it, maybe he could make an artificial intelligence that could tell you what you did wrong. But until he can do that. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, but, but this concept of emergent behavior, I think, is something that gets talked a lot about a lot in the AI world and in other worlds, the evolution of life discussions, emergent behavior, something that's coming out that's more than the pieces that went in. Um, I kind of use as a metaphor, and it's not very strong in the book. It was very strong in the screenplay because I needed a visual way to get across the concept of emergent behavior. But I spent about a decade working on color measurement equipment. And one of the things you learn in color measurement is there is no such thing as the color purple. There is there is no light you can point to in in terms of frequency and say that frequency is purple. You can point to red, you can point to blue, you can point to yellow, you can point to green, but purple is what happens when our eyes pick up red and blue light at the same time. They create this this imaginary color called purple. And that's how our eyes and our brains cope with the fact that we're seeing these two very different pieces of information simultaneously. It says purple is when you're seeing reds and blues. And so that was a useful visual metaphor for the concept that sometimes there's something that's clearly there. Because we've all seen purple. We see purple every day. But if you look at the pieces that went into it, there is no frequency of light you can point to and say that is purple. What we call violet on the spectrum is close, but it doesn't cover all the different purples we can see. Because most of the purples we can see are blends of red and blue. And, you know, if you take a blend of red and green, you get a yellow. But yellow is also on the spectrum. If you take a blend of green and blue, you get a cyan. And cyan is on the spectrum. If you take a blend of blue and red, if you were to plot the midpoint between them on the spectrum, you're in the green, and purple doesn't look green. But our brain has mm. figured out that we're going to call this thing purple when we see the red and the blue together. And that, I thought, was an interesting metaphor for emergent behavior that carries behavior in terms of being an actual person is a combination of these two pieces of behavior of understanding what someone's going through and understanding how to portray them. When you put that together, that was adding up to an actual personality. That sounds somewhat like what fiction writers do when they write stories, Martin. It is. It's very much a case of... And then create characters. 
Yeah, I, I think there's a, a piece of that there. I don't know how well it comes across in the manuscript, but it's part of my philosophy that as writers, we have to become these characters if we're going to write them truthfully. And so to understand them, we have to to become them, we have to understand them. We have to try to put ourselves in their positions and see that. And as I think about this, I start thinking, you know, that's probably a large part of what being a person is in, in terms of a person in the world. Um, way back when in Scientific American, they used to have these columns by Douglas Hofstetter and eventually collected them in a book called Metamagical Themas. And a lot of what he explores in that is concepts of consciousness. And one of those, one of the big concepts he talks about is analogy. That part of what makes you conscious is recognizing in others what you see in yourself. And I think in the back of my mind, that has always been part of my theory of consciousness. And I think that's part of how Carrie is built is Carrie learns to, it's sort of the opposite. Carrie's built to understand what's in you, and it learns to see that in itself because it's seen it in you. However you made him uh, or it, you have created a, uh, I think, a beautiful, uh, a moving, and also philosophically uh, fascinating book about it. The art is by Adam Byrne. How do you feel about that great cover? <laughs> I, I, I think that is... That, that cover just literally left me speechless at Liberty Con last year when I saw it. It's, it's so – I couldn't imagine how someone could capture the spirit of this book, and he did it, and he did it perfectly. This picture of Carrie and the sort of phantom image of Millie in the background just captured what the book is right in there. I, I was literally speechless, and it, it, for those who know me, to, for me to be speechless, that's quite an accomplishment. And the book is Today I'm Carrie by Martin L. Shoemaker. Uh, Martin, thank you so much for uh, talking to us about Today I'm Carrie. Yes, and thank you for having me on. It's good to talk to you again. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. While she thought through her predicament, Rada pretended to shop at one of the many stalls in front of the protector's compound. One in particular was selling glass pens, a fantastic invention loved by all librarians, which was when Rada made the enlightening discovery that merchants' prices went down when their potential customer was attractive and showing off some skin. There was a commotion, and the crowd began parting. Protector coming through, miss. Best to get out of his way, the pen merchant warned her. Some don't take kindly to being delayed. She did, as cautioned, temporarily getting her hopes up, until she saw that this wasn't the protector she was looking for. This one was a huge, ugly man, carrying a great big hammer over one silver-armored shoulder. Despite being big enough to shove anyone out of his way, 
He seemed remarkably polite in letting the lower caste choppers pass. The guards saw the protector coming and opened the gate for him. This was her chance. It was like the crowd opened up for the protector and then reformed in his wake. So she walked into that uncomfortable mass of annoying humanity and followed him all the way to the entrance. Over the last few yards, the crowd thinned down to nothing, and then she was standing there before a couple of warriors and a really scary-looking man with a hammer designed for bashing people's brains out. Somehow the protector heard her over the noise, or maybe even smelled all that ridiculous perfume her sister had slathered her in, and he turned around to study her. He may have looked like an ox, but surprisingly, he had quick, intelligent eyes that wouldn't be so out of place on a librarian. He had a very deep voice. Can I help you? I'm here to see Lord Protector Devadas, Radha proclaimed. Do you have an appointment? She hadn't expected that. Radha had no idea what to say. Did pleasure women make appointments? Yes. The protector glanced at the guards, one of whom shook his head in the negative. He turned back to her. I'm sorry. What's your name? She damned near blurted out her real name, but choked it off just in time. Radha hadn't thought of needing a fake name. Obviously, all those married first-caste ladies carrying on their scandalous secret affairs with the Lord Protector had fake names. Daksha! It was the first thing that popped into her head. I am Protector of the Law, 15 years senior, Kano Utara. He planted himself squarely in her path, like a massive, unyielding steel wall. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. What is your business with Lord Protector Devadas? A personal matter. Radha realized that by lying to this man, he was legally justified in taking that hammer from his shoulder and whacking her with it. And that hammer was nearly as big as she was. All that would be left of her would be a red smear across the market. The merchants would have to discount their stained goods. So... Telling the truth was very tempting, but she couldn't risk speaking freely yet. The walls have ears. A very, very personal matter. Kano didn't seem convinced, neither did the two warriors behind him, who traded grins as they leaned on their spears. This wasn't going well. What would Darksa do? She was a natural flirt, and Radha had observed her use her skills to manipulate men into doing whatever she wanted. So Radha tried to channel her sister and gave the protector what she thought of as a saucy look and a wink. Is there something wrong with your eye, miss? He asked, expressionless. What? No, I'm fine. You see, I'm a pleasure woman, come to, you know for the Lord Protector. Carno nodded slowly. Of course. May I see your obligation documents and Arbiter's stamp? Uh-oh. Rada didn't even know they had such a thing, but everything else was regulated, so why not that as well? She'd begun sweating. I left my papers in my other dress. Of course. I'll take you to him. Follow me. Kano turned and walked through the gate. Radha breathed a sigh of relief and followed. The guards got out of her way and closed the gate behind them. Inside the compound was a courtyard, but rather than manicured grass like would be found in a typical first-caste estate, this was nothing but packed dirt and gravel and several young protectors were currently practicing their swordplay across it. Thank you, Protector Kana. I am... And the next thing she knew, she was falling. Radha landed hard on the ground. Kana was standing over her. Somehow he'd swept her legs out from under her and dropped her right into the dirt. Radha hadn't even seen him move. She'd never thought something ox-sized could be that fast. 
If you're a pleasure woman, I'm the presiding judge. Kano bent over and ran his rough hands through her clothing. For a moment, she thought he was going to assault her, but he'd only been searching her, and removed her knife and the pouch that held her replacement glasses. While he inspected the items, he lowered his hammer and let it rest on her sternum. Even with most of the weight still being taken by his arm, it felt like it could crush her flat. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And the final email containing the emoji of enlightenment in an email chain about basically nothing much that, if pulled out to its full length, stretches across 14 billion years. Plus the greatest, fastest, bravest, and deepest plaudits, thanks and praise for Martin L. Shoemaker, author of Today I Am Carrie. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 